All right, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to Politics and Pros Live. My name is Bashan. I am part of the event staff with Politics and Pros. Uh, before we do get started, I wanted to just go over a couple of quick things. First is that um, at any time during our event, you can go to the chat section found at the bottom of your screen. Um, you'll be able to use a link which will be in there to go directly to the Politics and Pros website where you can purchase a copy of Sex with Presidents by Eleanor Herman. Of course, uh, any purchases are appreciated and encouraged um, as that helps us provide these events. The other part is at any point during the event, if you would like to directly ask a question of the author, we request you go to the Q&A box, which is separate from the chat, and try to put your questions in there just to help us kind of facilitate and ease that uh, process along. Um, without any further ado, I'd like to welcome to PNP Live Ms. Eleanor Herman. Um, Ms. Eleanor Herman is a New York Times bestselling author of Sex with Kings, Sex with the Queen, and several other works of popular history. She has hosted Lost Worlds for the History Channel, The Madness of Henry VIII for, Na for the National Geographic Channel, and is now filming her second season of America Fact Versus Fiction for the American Heroes Channel. In this fascinating work of popular history, the New York Times bestselling author, uh, well, again, of the best, of best-selling author of Sex with Kings and the Royal Art of Poison, uncovers the bedroom secrets of American presidents and explores the surprising ways voters have reacted to their leaders' as sex scandals. Um, Ms. Herman revisits some of the sex scandals that have rocked the nation's capital and shocked the public while asking the provocative questions, does rampant adultery show a lack of character or the stamina needed to run the country, or perhaps both? <laughs> I'll try not to laugh on that one too. Um, while Americans have judged their leaders' affairs harshly compared to other nations, do they mostly just hate being lied to? And do they now clearly care more about issues other than the politician's sex life? Um, Ms. Herman, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. So I think this is my sixth uh, book event at Politics and Prose. And it's also my first Zoom book event. And what's really great about Zoom book events is that more people get to attend. I know that I have several friends from across the country who are uh, watching this tonight. Um, and I have to say, I miss being in the room with you all. I miss the energy. I miss seeing your faces. There's always one person in the front few rows who's looking at me and smiling and nodding their head. I miss that. And, and afterwards, I, I would like to shake your hands and hug you and personalize your books. And I can't do that tonight. But let's just do the best we can with what we have. And uh, I will uh, talk to you now about sex with presidents. I'm going to share my screen and hope that the technology gods are gonna be with me tonight. Yay, and there they are. All right, so. As you heard, my first book was Sex with Kings, which looked at the lives of European royal mistresses. And my second was Sex with the Queen, which examined queens who had love affairs. And recently, what with all the allegations of the bad behavior of the current resident of the White House, I decided to explore sex with presidents. So as a descendant of Mayflower pilgrims, I've always been aware of a strong streak of Puritan prudery in our national culture, despite the hundreds of millions of immigrants to this country from every part of the world. And going into researching this book, I believed that fairly recently, American voters, unlike their European counterparts, must have been horrified by any political sex scandals and would mostly not have voted four candidates embroiled in them. And you know what? I couldn't have been more wrong. The first US political sex scandal involved not a president, but one of our founding fathers. Alexander Hamilton was quite influential in writing and interpreting the Constitution and was the first secretary of the US Treasury. 
handsome and flirtatious. She was happily married to a lovely woman, Elizabeth, and they had a growing brood of children. When, in 1791, the 34-year-old began an affair with 23-year-old Maria Reynolds. Unfortunately, we don't have a picture of Maria, but she must have been scintillatingly sexy because she had quite an effect on men. And since I couldn't stand the fact that there was no picture of her, I found two that could have been something uh, that she looked like based on the time period. So Maria and her husband, James, had set up her affair with Hamilton as part of a blackmail scheme. Hamilton paid them a lot of money, even as he kept having an affair with Maria. He finally broke it off within a year, but he had written her a lot of letters. And when the scandal broke in the press in 1796, leaked by Hamilton's arch enemy, Thomas Jefferson, Hamilton was accused of more than having an extramarital affair. His political opponents saw the payments he made to James Reynolds as proof that Hamilton was using him to speculate in government investments on his behalf, thereby breaking Hamilton's own anti-speculation laws and making an illegal fortune. Instead of denying the affair, as many politicians would have done, Hamilton wrote a 100-page pamphlet admitting it, including every letter he, Maria, and James had written each other, but denying breaking any laws. The American public appreciated his honesty. They didn't care about his sex life, but they would have been furious if he had been financially corrupt, and his reputation suffered little damage in the long run. In 1787, the widower Thomas Jefferson, the US ambassador to Paris, wanted to bring his nine-year-old daughter Polly over from Virginia to join him and her 15-year-old sister. There were difficulties in finding a suitable companion to look after Polly on the journey, and ultimately one of Jefferson's enslaved people at his plantation Monticello, 14-year-old Sally Hemings, was given the task. Sally was his late wife's half-sister, as Martha Jefferson's father had had several children with one of his enslaved women. On the left is Jefferson during his tenure as US ambassador to France. He was well into his 40s, but a tall and handsome man. And on the right is a photo from the movie Belle that came out a few years ago. And this is how I imagine Sally Hemings in France. She would have been dressed to the nines as the lady's maid of the US ambassador's daughters and would have gone to the court of Versailles with them to see King Louis XVI and Queen Marie Antoinette. Unfortunately, there is no portrait of Sally, though she was described as being extraordinarily beautiful. We don't know when a sexual relationship began, but when Jefferson went back to Virginia two years later, 16-year-old Sally was pregnant. Now, she could have obtained her freedom by staying in France, but Jefferson per persuaded her to return to Virginia with him, promising that he would free their children when they turned 21, and she complied. They had seven children over the next 20 years, four of whom lived to adulthood. When Jefferson was president, a muckraking hack journalist discovered that Jefferson had a relationship with his enslaved woman and several children with her. And he wrote the most scathing articles about him, hoping to make him lose the 1804 election. But American voters were happy with Jefferson's strong economy, low taxes, and the triumph of the Louisiana Purchase the year before when he had doubled the size of the country, a country with a pen stroke. Few cared about his relationship with Sally Hemings, and it appeared the two remained faithful to each other until Jefferson's death in 1826. Few people know that we had a gay president, James Buchanan, who was the president right before Abraham Lincoln. Buchanan had a 13-year affair with a man, William Rufus King, who was vice president in 1853 and died in office. Neither of them ever married, which was quite unusual in political circles. Indeed, James Buchanan is the only US president who never married. In Washington, they were known as Mr. and Mrs. Buchanan or Miss Nancy and Aunt Fancy, terms at the time used to denote gay men. 
When King served as ambassador to France in 1844, Buchanan wrote a friend, I am so solitary and alone, having no companion with me. I have gone wooing to several gentlemen, but not have succeeded with any of them. The story, by the way, never made it into the press. In 1873, Grover Cleveland, a 36-year-old bachelor lawyer and the sheriff of Buffalo, New York, was courting 33-year-old Maria Halpin, a lovely widow with two children who sold clothing at a large department store. One night he raped her and she became pregnant. She begged him to marry her to salvage the situation and he refused. When she had the baby, Cleveland took him away and gave him to a childless friend to adopt. He put Maria in an insane asylum against her will, though she got out after a few days. Fast forward 10 years and Cleveland, who had in the interim been mayor of Buffalo and governor of New York State, is running for president with a national reputation for rooting out corruption, cutting taxes, and genuine accountability to his constituents. After Cleveland was nominated as Democratic candidate, people who knew about what happened to Maria gave the story to the press. Interestingly, Cleveland did not deny it. He was furious with his campaign staff who painted Maria as a whore sleeping with several men at the time. And Maria, to defend herself, jumped into the fray and told her side of the story. The whole country was in, in an uproar over it for several weeks leading up to the election. Cleveland's opponent, Republican candidate James Blaine, had a spotless private life, but stole money hand over fist from the government in a series of dirty deals. So. How would the American public vote for a sanctified sex life or for a rapist who would save them taxes? Well, they voted for the rapist at the height of the Victorian era. Here's a cartoon during the campaign showing Maria with a squalling infant. Cleveland's opponents kept heckling him at his rallies with, Ma, Ma, where's my pa? And after he won the election, his supporters cried, gone to the White House, ha, ha, ha. In 1886, Cleveland, a 49-year-old bachelor, married the lovely Frances Folsom, at 21, the youngest first lady the United States has ever had. In 1908, Woodrow Wilson was the president of Princeton University and happily married to his wife of 20 years, Ellen, on the right. He went to Bermuda for several weeks that winter to reduce his blood pressure, which was sky high due to stress. And while doctors of the time could measure blood pressure, there was no medication to reduce it. So they prescribed relaxation. It was there in Bermuda that Wilson met a charming married socialite named Mary Hulbert Peck on the left and began a heated affair with her that lasted several years, though it cooled off once he became president in 1912. When Ellen Wilson died of kidney disease in 1914, many believed that Wilson would, after a suitable period of mourning, marry Mary, who was by then divorced. Well, they were wrong. Just a few months after he lost his wife, the grieving president met a Washington DC socialite, the wealthy widow Edith Galt, and was completely smitten. After a torrid courtship, they married. When Wilson had a series of debilitating strokes in 19, 1919, it was Edith Wilson who had left school at the age of 14, who was effectively running the country. She would take papers from senators and cabinet officials, go into her husband's darkened sick room and pretend to get instructions from him, though he was often crying and unable to speak. It was because of Edith that the 25th Amendment was passed, providing measures to ensure that the vice president becomes acting president if the president is unable to discharge the powers of duties of his office. Warren Harding was quite a ladies man. There was something about him, photographs, just don't do it justice, that turned otherwise normal women into howling cats in heat. Widows, teenagers, socialites, actresses, respectable married women followed him around begging to bed him and he usually complied. This drove his long suffering wife, Florence, mad with jealousy. My favorite story is the one where Florence, 
told by her Secret Service agent that Warren was having sex with a girl in the Oval Office, went banging on the door, but was prevented from entering by one of Warren's Secret Service agents. By the time she did enter, the girl had been spirited away and Harding was sitting at his desk perusing papers. Harding was unwise enough to write his lover's 50-page pornographic letters, which many of them sold back to the Republican National Committee when he became the Republican candidate in 1920. Harding, who was a kind-hearted, financially honest soul, felt that he had to repay these donors after he won the election, and he gave them cabinet positions as a thank you. Unfortunately, some of them robbed the country blind, most of the scandal coming out after his sudden death in 1923 from heart failure, but the scandals ruined his legacy. Something else tarnished his reputation. He had had an affair with a young woman named Nan Britton, who had a daughter she claimed was his. After Harding's death, Nan didn't have the money to support her daughter and asked the Harding family for support. They turned her down and said it wasn't his daughter. Nan wrote the first presidential sex scandal tell-all, a book called The President's Daughter, and made a fortune. And in 2015, a DNA test of Nan's grandson and Harding's great nephew proved the child had been the president's after all. In 1905, 23-year-old Franklin Roosevelt married a distant cousin, 21-year-old Eleanor Roosevelt, against his mother's wishes. He loved Eleanor for her seriousness, her kindness, and intelligence, while all the other debutantes he found flighty and flirtatious. Alas, the bride and groom were ill-suited. Franklin loved sex and feminine, soothing women with a great sense of humor. Eleanor hated sex had almost no sense of humor, hectored him constantly, and seemed to grow less feminine as time wore on. In 1916, Franklin began an affair with Eleanor's social secretary, Lucy Mercer, and here she is on the left at about the time the affair began, and on the right some 20 years later. Lucy was everything Franklin wanted in a woman, smiling, soothing, laughing, and very feminine. When Eleanor found out about the affair in 1918, she demanded a, a divorce and Franklin eagerly agreed. He wanted to marry Lucy, the love of his life. But his mother, who held the purse strings and paid all of Franklin's bills, announced she would cut him off without a dime. It would be a social disgrace. So Franklin and Eleanor stayed together, but never more as man and wife. Lucy married an extremely wealthy man, but never gave up Franklin entirely. Behind Eleanor's back, the two continued to see each other and never fell out of love. In fact, Lucy was with Franklin that day in April 1945 when he had his fatal stroke. But Franklin had another long-term mistress, Missy LeHand, his secretary of 20 years efficient, charming, feminine. She lived in the White House and was seen wafting in and out of his bedroom at all hours to take dictation, she said, though servants reported seeing her in her nightgown with no steno pad in hand. Eleanor Roosevelt, too, was not without consolation. Just about the time that she became First Lady in 1933, she began an affair with a journalist named Lorena Hickok, known as Hick, a star reporter for the Associated Press. The affair ended after a couple of years. Eleanor became an international star, working for civil rights, women's rights, and helping the underprivileged, and she didn't have time for Hick anymore. Though Eleanor took care of Hick, who later suffered from diabetes and went blind until her dying day. In 1942, General Dwight Eisenhower was working in London on an invasion of Nazi-occupied Europe. And in England, all of the street signs had been taken down so that if the Germans landed, they would be totally confused as to where to go. So the top uh, American military brass had to use local English drivers who knew every street in London by heart and for miles around. Eisenhower, as luck was ha would have it, was assigned a beautiful, vibrant 33-year-old driver named Kay Summersby. And while waiting to drive him around, she started helping in his office and soon became his top aide. They often spent 16 hours a day, 
seven days a week working and relaxing uh, together with some other aides. And when her fiance stepped on a landmine in North Africa, Eisenhower and Kay realized that they had been in love for a long time. He talked to her about leaving his wife, Mamie, shown here, and marrying Kay, and about having a child with her. But on the two occasions they tried to have sex, according to Kay, he couldn't do it. Soon after the second time, after the war had been won, he was sent back to Washington and called his entire staff to join him at the Pentagon, except for Kay, and it broke her heart. The man who faced down Hitler didn't have the courage to tell Kay face to face that it was over. As she wrote her autobiography in the 1970s while she was dying of cancer, she made it clear that she never stopped loving him. JFK and Jackie were the most attractive first couple ever. The American public though had no idea what a sham their marriage was. Jack Kennedy was a pathological philanderer. At a big party on their Mexican honeymoon, he disappeared with a woman leaving his wife to sit there in utter humiliation. When Jackie gave birth to a stillborn daughter, he and his brother Teddy were sailing the Mediterranean with three Swedish blondes, and he didn't want to come back to visit his wife in the hospital. What can I do about it, he said. Jackie wanted to leave him before they had children, but her father-in-law bribed her to stay in the marriage, afraid that a divorced man could never become president. And after she had her daughter, Caroline, she probably realized she was stuck with him. It is possible that Kennedy had an antibiotic resistant strain of chlamydia, which he gave Jackie, which would explain why out of five pregnancies, she had only two living children. Living with such a shameless philanderer, she grew depressed and started using prescription drugs to deaden the pain. Before she became First Lady, she had had an affair with Hollywood actor William Holden, and in the months before her husband's assassination, she had another one with Aristotle Anassas, whom she later married. Jack Kennedy had sex, often several times a day, with all kinds of women, socialites, his White House employees, actresses, and prostitutes. He liked to have sex with these women in his wife's bed. The, uh, the president had his own bedroom. The first lady has hers in the White House. Uh, when Jackie was out of the White House, which was often because she just really couldn't stand being there that much, he made the Secret Service and household staff pick hairs and bobby pins off her sheets instead of changing them after he had had sex with some woman on them. One night, Jackie found a pair of women's panties under her pillow, dangled them from her finger, and told him to find the owner as they were not her size. He often had orgies in the White House swimming pool, which is still under the press briefing room you see on television today. So on the right, we have one of the President's most famous lovers, Marilyn Monroe, singing Happy Birthday, Mr. President at Maryland Square Garden in 1962. Apparently, it was so obvious to everyone who saw them that night that they were having an affair, they practically just oozed sex, that Jack dumped her right away, handing her over to his brother Bobby to console her, and boy, did he. On the left is a less famous lover of the president. Her name is Mimi Beardsley. She was a 19-year-old intern in the White House press office in 1962, whom the president invited to see his private quarters upstairs. And when she was there, he forced Mimi down on Jackie's bed, of course, and had sex with her. Mimi didn't call it rape. She later wrote that she was so shocked she just let it happen. But she did go home that night in a taxi, sad that she would no longer be a virgin on her wedding night. This is Judith Campbell, who had a multi-year affair with JFK at the same time that she was the mistress of Sam Giancana, a Chicago mob boss who took over from Al Capone. This presented the president with a huge security risk, but he didn't care. According to Judith's memoir, even after FBI director J. Edgar Hoover told the president the mafia could tape record them and use this to blackmail the president of the United States, Kennedy continued to see her. This is Ellen Romich, an East German call girl who had an affair with JFK. J. Edgar Hoover also investigated her and found that she was probably a spy for the Soviet Union. Attorney General Bobby Kennedy was horrified and convinced his brother finally to take national security seriously, and Ellen was sent packing to Germany. 
Usually JFK was completely reckless in his disregard of both his personal safety and national security when it came to his sex life. Women would show up at the White House saying the president was waiting for him and the Secret Service knew they had to let him up without vetting him. The president was in no mood to wait right? And any one of them could have killed Kennedy, especially as they often prepared food in the private kitchen after sex, and there were plenty of knives lying around. So when Kennedy was entertaining a woman in his private quarters, he let the staff know not to come up there. The White House electrician reported that one night he went in the elevator to a higher level to change a light bulb and pushed the wrong button. And when the doors opened, he saw a blonde White House secretary running towards him, breasts swinging, as he described it. He quickly pushed the button to close the doors. Lyndon Johnson came from a dirt poor Texas childhood, but had a brilliant mind for politics. In the early 1930s, he was a congressman's aide with aspirations of becoming president, if only he could find a rich wife. He met Lady Bird Taylor and swept her off her feet. Still, that didn't stop him from having love affairs. His steamiest relationship was with Alice Glass, the six foot tall red haired mistress of an important newspaper tycoon. There was talk in Washington about whether Lyndon would leave his wife to marry Alice, but the fact is no matter how badly he at times treated Lady Bird, he idolized her. And after she accepted the fact that he needed to have women on the side, it was a very happy marriage other than that. One day as First Lady, Lady Bird walked into the Oval Office to find her husband having sex with a secretary on the sofa. She excused herself and backed out. Lyndon was so furious, he had a buzzer system installed so that when Lady Bird came toward the Oval Office, the Secret Service would buzz him so that he would have time to pull his pants up and sit down at his desk perusing papers. So in our first few slides, I talked about the muckraking journalism that attacked Alexander Hamilton, Thomas Jefferson, and Grover Cleveland for their sexual indiscretions. But that kind of media stopped right around 1900. Journalism, which had been seen as a rather sordid trade, became a respected profession. The National Press Club was formed with a code of journalistic ethics, and gentlemen didn't write about other gentlemen's love affairs. Though political journalists knew all about Woodrow Wilson's Mrs. Peck and Warren Harding's hundreds of girlfriends and Franklin Roosevelt's Lucy Mercer and Missy LeHand and JFK's affairs with Marilyn Monroe and countless others, they never reported it. Then a few things happened. The Vietnam War and Lyndon Johnson's lies about it tarnished the reputation of the presidency. Teddy Kennedy's drunken careening off a bridge at Chappaquiddick, killing a young woman, made a lot of reporters feel guilty, as they had known for years that he was a drunken mess and an accident waiting to happen, and they never wrote a word about it. But most importantly, Watergate happened. Suddenly, presidents were not to be protected by journalists. They were to be investigated. And almost immediately after Watergate, all the stories about JFK and his women tumbled out into the press. Now, at this point, I'm supposed to remind you to please send in your questions so I can answer them as soon as this presentation is over. The first presidential contender to learn the hard way that times had changed was Gary Hart, a popular senator from Colorado who in 1987 seemed like a sure thing to become the Democratic candidate the following year. In May of that year, reporters at the Miami Herald received an anonymous tip that a blonde would be visiting the married Hart at his Capitol Hill townhouse one weekend, and the reporters staked out the house. They found him coming and going with Donna Rice, a 27-year-old model, who apparently had spent that Friday night with him. Hart was outraged that anyone would intrude into his personal life, and he denied having an affair with Rice, but it seemed clear he was lying, and lying in an obnoxious, pontificating, holier-than-thou way. Polls showed two-thirds of Americans didn't care about his sex life, but they didn't like being lied to. Hart dropped out of the race in disgrace. If he had asked forgiveness with tears in his eyes, he probably could have stayed in. 
The next presidential candidate with a scandalous personal life was Bill Clinton. He had, in fact, been planning on entering the 1988 race until he saw what happened to Gary Hart, and then he quickly changed his mind. By 1991, when he entered the race, he had his story straight. He would tell the press his marriage had had problems, but that was all in the past. When, however, early in 1992, a nightclub singer named Jennifer Flowers came forward alleging a 12-year affair with Clinton in Arkansas, Bill denied it. And during the campaign, Hillary hired a private eye and other staff to dig into the lives of any woman who might make a similar allegation and scare them into staying quiet or ruining their reputations if they did not. Voters, however, didn't seem to care about the likes of Jennifer Flowers. What did land Bill in a tub of very hot water was his affair with a 22-year-old White House intern, Monica Lewinsky. And once again, it was his lies that got him in trouble, not the sex. During an investigation, Clinton lied to special prosecutors about it, perjuring himself, whereas Monica had DNA proof on a little blue dress in the freezer. And it was that that got Clinton impeached though he was not removed from office, as we know. And oddly, the final week of his impeachment proceedings, Clinton's ratings were the highest ever, 73%. Many Americans felt that he was the victim of sexual McCarthyism, and he had only lied about sex, and everybody lies about sex. So that by the time we hit the late 1990s, America doesn't even care if politicians lie to them about sex which was a good thing for the next president involved in a sex scandal. Even evangelical Christians who were furious at Clinton's antics with, with women understand that Trump has always been a playboy and a ladies man, cheating on all three of his wives and lying about it, and they don't care. Now, most of Trump's supporters don't even care about numerous allegations of sexual assault or his boasting about it on tape. And I think this means that we're living in a post-sex scandal world. The current Trump sex scandal is that in paying off two women for their silence shortly before the 2016 election, Playboy Playmate of the Year Karen McDougal and adult film star Stormy Daniels, Trump may have violated campaign finance regulations. And this investigation is still going forward. It's a similar situation to that of Clinton 20 years earlier, and that if both men had just said, yeah, I did it, I'm ashamed of myself, I owe an apology to my wife and the American people, there would have been no legal repercussions. That is what Trump should have done. And from now on, that is what every politician involved in a similar situation should do. The fact is, no one really cares about their sex lives. In 1884, most people didn't care that Grover Cleveland had raped a woman and lying just gets them in legal trouble. So the last section of my book looks at political sex scandals in other nations to compare them with our own sex scandals. The French in particular see a lusty sex life as evidence of strength, virility, and leadership. When the Monica Lewinsky scandal came out in 1997, the French were utterly mystified by it and they dubbed it Le Zippergate. One French politician, Christine Boutin, said, he loves women, this man, it is a sign of good health. Before he became president of France in 1981, Francois Mitterrand lived for many years with his wife and her young lover in a Paris apartment. It shocks American sensibilities to imagine the three of them dipping croissants into their cafe au lait at the breakfast table. We cannot picture, for instance, Bill and Hillary Clinton inviting Monica Lewinsky to live with them and the three buttering their toast together at the White House, or Stormy Daniels passing a, a bowl of scrambled eggs to Melania Trump. Francois, for his part, probably had thousands of lovers, though his skills in bed were not that great. His mistresses called him five minutes, shower included. There was one woman, however, whom he loved most of all and with whom he shared decades of family life, Anne Pinjot, pictured here with their daughter Mazarin at Mitterrand's funeral in 1996. When the French magazine Paris Match revealed the affair and the daughter in 1994, the French people were furious at the magazine for invading the family's privacy. But I will leave you with my favorite French sex scandal. In 1899, President Félix Faure of France 
was entertaining his mistress, a 27-year-old socialite named Marguerite Steinheil, when he suddenly had a massive heart attack. His hands were locked into rigid fists in her hair, an iron grip from which Marguerite could not extricate herself. She called for the guards who broke down the door and, summing up the situation, grabbed a pair of scissors to cut off the hair on the top of her head to free her. The palace descended into an uproar and the first lady was on her way. Marguerite grabbed her clothing and, sporting a very unattractive new hairstyle, raced out of the palace. Unfortunately, she left her corset on the floor, which the first lady found. It can be said that Felix Faure was one of the few political leaders who came and went at the same time. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Coming right back. Woo. <laughs> Very well done, Ms. Thurman. Um, well, we you have quite a few questions. Oh, good. Right? I love questions. Ask me, ask me. Um, it's so many. Hopefully, we have no time to do them all. Um, let's start with the first one. Um, this is a pretty good one. Okay. From an anonymous viewer. Um, their question is, do you believe if the president were a woman, um, would anything in your findings suggest that they will be held to a different standard and judged differently um, as all of these men have been. If the president was a woman, I, I don't think I would have a book to write. I mean, look, look at the world leaders. And I really did. I, I, I analyzed it. Margaret Thatcher, Golda Meir, Angela Merkel. You know, I was hoping to dig up some scandalous thing and, and, and there isn't. If we had a female president, who, against all odds, uh, had an extramarital affair, oh, she would be pilloried. She'd be called a whore. I mean, when, when Kamala Harris was named vice president, it's Joe and the Ho, right? I mean, you know, and, and Trump, there's how many allegations of sexual assault? That doesn't seem to bother anybody. But Camilla had an affair 25 years ago with a man who'd been separated from his wife for 13 years, and she's a ho. What would they do to a woman president? A, a totally different standard than, than what we're seeing right now. Good Excellent point. question, by the way, to Anonymous. Yeah. Thank you. So here's one uh, from David Kaplan. He asks, was Buchanan engaged to a woman in his 20s? He recalls that she died before they wedded. Yes, it's a very mysterious story. He was a young man and um, he, he was engaged. And she, she died under secret circumstances. There is, there's some um, rumor that she may have killed herself. And, and that is all we know about it. And I, I would sure love to, to, to learn more about that one, but that no one can say anything more. Okay, so here's, I think is a very good one I would like to know from Monique. She said, would you please talk about your research process and what primary sources uh, do you use for this? So um, I, you know, st I started off more as an expert of uh, Royal European history than, than uh, American history. So this has been a fascinating opportunity for me to just delve into the American history. And I started off in terms of sex scandals, looking at JFK, Roosevelt, Eisenhower, obviously Clinton and Trump and reading everything I could about uh, them. Um, that's well documented. And then for the, uh, for the earlier ones, um, it's, it's in the newspapers, you know, Thomas Jefferson's story with Sally Hemings was in the press and Alexander Hamilton with Maria Reynolds and uh, Grover Cleveland's uh, rape uh, was in the newspapers for, for weeks on end. Um, the interesting thing is after Watergate, so many people started stepping forward and writing their memoirs. Uh, people who had uh, been servants in the White House, people who had slept with uh, JFK, quite a few of the women wrote, wrote their autobiographies. So all of this is very well documented. And anyone who's interested in looking at my sources, um, there's a really detailed multi-page uh, bibliography at the back of the book. Perfect. Okay. Um, so here's another anonymous uh, question. They ask, is there a distinction between dehumanizing women as the current occupant of the White House does and presidents having affairs? Oh, absolutely. 
absolutely. I mean, the interesting thing about the stories is that they run the gamut. Yes, there's this, the common element is uh, an extramarital affair, but there are also some beautiful love stories like um, FDR uh, with Lucy Mercer. Those two loved each other till the day he died. And Kay Summers, Summersby's love for Dwight Eisenhower. I mean, she just never got over him. And the two of them worked hand in hand to defeat Adolf Hitler. And there are some really gripping, beautiful love stories. And then there's, then there's like, you know, what we have now in the White House. Uh, and then there's JFK, who I think also was incredibly demeaning to, to women. And if he's going to have sex, with a woman in the White House, why would he do it on his wife's bed? That's just like, is it to humiliate her? Yeah, so it just runs the gamut of beautiful love stories to like really disgusting, demeaning women's stories. Okay, uh, here's, uh, well, I'll just read it. Hi, Eleanor, it's Emily Witten. Can oh, you Emily! <laughs> she says, can you talk a little bit about any age and power discrepancies and whether there are patterns or what your thoughts are. Um, also, congratulations on the new book. She's looking forward to reading it. Well, I, I think there are two, two that come immediately to my, well, actually three. One is Mimi Beardsley, the 19-year-old intern who, I mean, I think today we would just call it rape, you know, even though she, she didn't. Um, the other one is clearly Sally Hemings, because, you know, being enslaved, I mean, she did have the, the choice to leave France, but God knows what pressure he put on her because her family was still enslaved at, at the plantation that he was going back to. So maybe she felt that she just needed to, to go to, to, to help them. So that was just a huge discrepancy, not only in age, because he was 30 some years older, but, but clearly uh, in power. Um, and then the other one that comes to mind is Bill Clinton, who was what, 47 or 48, and Monica Lewinsky, who was 21 or two. Um, and she, he, was, he was the head of government and she was the lowliest form of employee. She wasn't even getting paid at first, right? She was an intern. So back, you know, for years she said, yeah, yeah, she, she took responsibility that I was an adult and, and I, I agreed to do this, though, after uh, the advent of Me Too, she said, you know, maybe it, maybe it wasn't as consensual as, as I might have, have thought. There was just such a distinction in terms of the, the equation of power. Yeah, the power dynamic. Um, here is uh, one from Emily. Emily wants to know, what was the funniest story of a president that you discovered during this whole research process? Well, I, there were two of them, which, which I mentioned. One is Florence Harding banging on the door of the Oval Office, knowing that he's got a girl in there. He was actually inside a closet with this girl, and they had to spirit her out. And, you know, Florence was just so jealous of him. She thought if she could just grab onto his arm long enough um, that he wouldn't have affairs, and she'd be screaming in the front door of the White House, shocking all the servants who were used to better behavior from the presidents and first ladies. Warren, you're not leaving this White House tonight. And then the other one is um, is JFK, you know, uh, in flagrante delicto on the sofa in the Oval Office, and Lady Lady Bird walks in and says, "Oh, I'm so sorry," and walks back out. <laughs> Those are my two favorites. Um, here's, uh, Beverly wants to know, well, first she says she can't wait to read the book. And then she asks about how long did it take you to complete all of your research for this? Uh, you know, writing the book, oh, I think it was about nine months for the research and then maybe six months for writing it. And, and the research is really a slog. Like I read all the boring history books so my readers don't have to. Uh, for those of you who haven't read any of my books, um, they're not dull, they're not boring, they're very lively. They're almost like fiction, like you, you kind of slide into a story and it, it takes you into it. Um, so, you know, research can be really boring and I might have a thousand pages of, of notes from all these books and then I start crafting them into really entertaining stories. So, yeah. It, it was about a year and three months, I guess. So Emily um, wants to know, she says she missed the earlier part of discussion, 
and I don't think you touched on this in detail. She says, do you have any thoughts on RFK and the Jackie O affair rumors? She doesn't know if it's a wild myth or if there's any truth to it. Oh, I'm, I'm fairly certain it, it, it was true. You know, in the, in the aftermath of, um, of JFK's ass assassination, Bobby was, was just uh, a wreck with grief. And I, I think that um, Jackie was too. Was it Truman Capote who said that she really didn't care much about him until the minute he got shot? And then suddenly she, she was overwhelmed in grief. I mean, you could see in her pictures with the black veil uh, at the funeral. And I suppose it was only a matter of time before they found a certain amount of consolation um, with each other. And, and there were reports of, people seeing them on a private beach and she was topless and there were just a lot of stories like that and back then it wouldn't get into the press but if, uh, again this came out after Watergate. Um, oh, there's one question here now you kind of already touched on it um, they were asking about if the, there was an unfaithful uh, female president uh, but she does ask something Maggie um, slightly different. Uh, do you think there will be any difference if perhaps um, we still had a first lady and the scandal revolved around her and her position as first lady, not as uh, president? You know, I think with regards to these things, women are always raked over the coals, pilloried, treated much worse than, than men. I mean, the word whore, for instance, um, what, what, is, what can you call a man that, that's that denigrating and that vicious? Whoremonger? No. I mean, there's, there's nothing that's, that's really equal. And I just think all women, you know, whatever they do, they're just going to get treated worse than, than men when it comes to any sexual indiscretion. I, I think that's fair. Um, I don't even think it's necessarily bad or a negative thing when a, the label of ho whore is applied to a man. I mean, it's not negative, used in a negative sense. It's just kind of factual and right. not controversial. Um, Roger says, why do you think people tend to ignore Trump's statements? Um, that, and that also, I think this is a good part of the question. Why do you think women in general seem to be drawn to people of power um, that can, they can get away with whatever? So drawn, you mean just in terms politically, or are we talking about the women who uh, want to have sex with people in power? Or is it clear to you what he means? He says seem to be drawn to people of power. Um, and he's, he now says get away with, he says specifically groping. Um, I'm, I'm well, guessing- well, I mean, I think that, um, there's something going on with Trump that I, I, I don't understand. Is it mass hypnosis? Is it, is it fear about certain social changes going on in the country? I don't, I mean, I think he could shoot a puppy and, and the dog lovers, half the dog lovers in America would say that was a rotten puppy and he should have been shot. So I, I, don't, I don't really know what's happening. I just want it to end really soon. <laughs> yeah, I think you're right. Um, and here's, um, we have some back to Anonymous. Um, this Anonymous viewer wants to know, um, since you didn't mention Presidents Carter or Obama, was there any information floating around on either of them? No. And well, Carter, Carter lusted in his heart. You know, um, Obama, if he did indeed lust in his heart, he, he didn't admit it. You know, and it's refreshing to see that not all of these guys are like JFK and Clinton and Trump, um, that, that there are some who, as, as far as we can tell, and I think really, if anything had been going on, we would have heard about it with all of the, uh, the nasty media these days, that they're, they're faithful to their wives. I mean, because the one question I do bring up in my book that I didn't get into in my presentation is that a lot of, of men running for the position of, of president are narcissists to begin with. They have to have this huge ego. And frankly, I think that you've got to be a little bit crazy to think you can run this country and actually want that job, right? I mean, what sensible person would want to be president? Um, and when they get in office, they feel that they can do whatever they want. 
And there's a, a psychological disorder called Huber syndrome, which was just discovered by psychologists about 10 years ago. And it only occurs when a person suddenly has tremendous power uh, and they start thinking they're invincible. They don't listen to the good advice of their advisors. They think they're God's uh, anointed, appointed. Uh, and this syndrome actually fades away when they lose that power. So, so that's something interesting that a lot of these guys are narcissists. And I think that having sex with all kinds of women um, it, it is a part of that. It's, it's ego and it's power. Um, another anonymous, um, they want to know, um, is there anything you're currently working on to come up next? Um, oh, anything? there is. And I am so excited about it. And it's, it's, it's just going to be the most amazing book. And I can't talk about it. So I'm really sorry. <laughs> But I, I really hope that Politics of Prose will, uh, will have me back. It's going to be the most fun project I've ever worked on. Oh, okay. That sounds exciting. You can put all this other stuff to shame. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> um, Rich wants to know, um, similar to the Carter and Obama question, you didn't mention Reagan. What, did you ever see any information surrounding his name? Uh, no, I, I mean, I imagine when he was a young Hollywood actor and he was single, they, they, you know, they were having affairs, but I think, I think Nancy would have killed him. So I don't, I don't think he did. Never heard a word about him. So here, let me see, I think we have, we have a mix, um, mostly comments, but some questions, I think, in the chat. Um, Melissa asked, um, you, or she says, you didn't include Mary Meyer as one of Kennedy's mistresses. Um, however, there are several books about her and their affair. I guess, do you have any comment uh, on that? Yes, uh, Ma Mary Meyer is in uh, my book. I just couldn't put everything in my book in my PowerPoint presentation. I'd be talking for like five hours. So, so you're right. Um, and uh, she was a, a socialite and uh, an artist and the sister-in-law of Bill Bradley, who later became the, um, the editor of the, of the Washington Post. And she died under very mysterious circumstances about a year after JFK's assassination. She had a diary which, uh, in which reportedly she said that she had smoked dope with JFK and, and tried all of these different pills and hallucinogens and LSD and, um, and she was shot on uh, her morning walk along the Georgetown towpath, and they never found uh, who did it. And when her brother-in-law went to her, her artist's um, studio, it was in his backyard in his garage uh, after the murder, he found someone high up at the CIA trying to break in and get the diary, and he, he gave it to them. So it was very, uh, very mysterious death of Mary Meyer. Um, <clears throat> we do have a few comments here. I want to make sure that you're aware of those, not just the questions. Um, <clears throat> Nicole says, Eleanor, we love you. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Um, Emily says, this is such an entertaining, fun, and interesting talk and a much needed distraction. <laughs> <laughs> it is, right? <laughs> um, oh, wait a minute. Uh, let me go back because now we got some last questions coming in. Um, again, Everyone, we have a few more minutes, so if you have any questions, this is your time now. Ask me questions. <laughs> um, anonymous viewer says, uh, I've never heard of this one, but did you ever look into a Vince Foster, Hillary Clinton allegation? Yes, um, that's in the Clinton um, chapter, as a matter of fact. Um, and um, Hillary worked at the Rose Law Firm in, uh, in Little Rock, Arkansas. Um, and uh, a friend of hers was another lawyer named Vince Foster, who was married with, I think, three kids, very gentlemanly, handsome fellow, um, rather soft-spoken. And when uh, Bill became president, they, they brought him up to, to work in the, in the White House in a legal capacity. And it, within a few months, he just couldn't take the uh, criticism in the media, and he, he was very... Um, 
you know, very depressed and he, he shot himself in a, in a local park. Now, there had been some speculation back in the, in the 80s that there might have been an affair. There was certainly a very, uh, a very strong friendship between the two. They'd have drinks together after work and they'd go to lunch together. Um, whether it was a fa an affair or not, sexual, I, I don't know. People at the time said that, that if it was a sexual affair, Hillary was certainly justified uh, based on everything that Bill was up to. All right. <clears throat> um, well, maybe we have time for a few more, but I want to get this one in here. This one just came in from Emily. She says, Eleanor, your books are always so entertaining and fun. Besides enjoyment, is there anything that you hope your readers take away from this book? Yeah, you know, for years now, reviewers have talked about how I write with wit, which is great. I love it. You know, you got to laugh or cry. So I, I choose to, to laugh. Um, but this one reviewer, uh, I think it was the New York Journal of Books, wrote for the first time something that is even more Im important to me about my writing. He said that I write with uh, kindness and empathy uh, and an understanding of people living in, in different times and places and situations. And so my exploration of people in history, um, it, it's important for all of us to, to have a bit of empathy for each other. You know, sometimes life is hard and we're put in very difficult situations. I mean, like Eleanor and FDR, they, they were both tremendously talented, kind, amazing people, and they were just so ill-suited as a married couple. So who's gonna judge them for finding love outside of that? So, so that's one thing I'd like my readers to get is, is to just drop um, harsh judgment unless it's truly and clearly warranted. That's an excellent answer. Um, this may be the last one for time, um, but Kara asks, what were the differences in researching American history compared to European? Uh, was one harder than the other? Um, and was one more fun or entertaining than the other? Good question, Kara. So uh, European history, I mean, we're dealing with how many countries I had to look at all their kings and queens. I mean, you know, you got England and Scotland and France and Germany and Italy and Spain. And so that took a really long time. And, you know, this is this is one country, right? So I just needed to go like down the list of these presidents. <laughs> I, and I also needed to uh, immerse myself in the American story and really, really learn you know, a lot more ab about the history. But, but still, overall, it was a lot easier to, to write about the presidents. Okay. Um, here's one from Kat. Kat asks, which president sacrificed the most to keep a relationship and who sacrificed the most in a relationship for the sake of the country? Who, all right, I'll read that again. Who had? Yeah, so it looks like it's two parts here. Okay. Which, which president sacrificed the most to keep a relationship? And then who sacrificed the most in a relationship for the sake of the country? Well, so I think the one who sacrificed the most to keep a relationship was FDR. Um, when he and Eleanor, when he agreed to Eleanor's conditions to stay married, because being divorced would ruin his political career in, in 1918, he agreed to give up Lucy Mercer. Um, and I think for a while he did, because she got married to a much older, wealthy man, but they never, they never stopped staying in touch. Uh, and then they, they got back to, together again, and he had to hide that from his wife, and then he got the daughter involved that she had to help arrange their meetings. And, you know, the daughter didn't want to, but here was a man dealing with the Great Depression, dealing with uh, Nazi Germany, Pearl Harbor, all of that. And he, he, he needed a little female companionship. And so for all of the stress that he put on his family to keep Lucy Mercer in his life, I, I, I think it, it was a sacrifice, but I think it was also uh, very 
very necessary for him. And I think if most people knew about it, given, given everything that was going on um, it, with his stress level, which eventually killed him, he died from a stroke. Um, I mentioned that Woodrow Wilson was told to relax when he had blood, high blood pressure. FDR was told by his doctors to relax, to reduce his sky high blood pressure in the weeks leading up to D-Day. So obviously that wasn't going to happen. So I, I think uh, I think that relationship <laughs> helped him get there as far as he as far as he could. Yeah, very good. And one last question. Um, this is what we ask of all of our PMP Live authors: Is there anything you're currently reading? And if so, could you please share that with us? Oh, a friend of mine gave me a fascinating, eye-opening book called White Fragility. Uh, the author is Robin D'Angelo, and it just it it sh has shown me how things I take for granted are are in some ways just inherent inherently racist, and it's not an insult, and it's not my fault. It's just people born in a particular place and time grow up thinking certain things are normal. For instance, if the hundred uh, top richest people in the world, ninety nine of them. Uh, are men and 98 are white, most of us wouldn't think there was anything odd about that. So this is just a really interesting book and especially with all of the conversations going on in this country right now about race, I can't uh, recommend it enough. It'll really get you thinking. Very good. Well, I'd like to thank everyone who has attended this event. Um, of course, I'd like to thank the author, Ms. Herman. This has been a wonderful event. Um, we look forward to your next big project and Thank we'll make you sure so much. I really enjoyed it. Next time in person, right? Because I want I want to see you all and feel the <laughs> energy in the room. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> all right. All right. Have a good evening, everyone, and thank you very Bye. much. Bye. Thank you for coming.